202 students. This lecture is just a short set of slides related to exchanging ideas. What makes intellectual property really property? A perspective on intellectual property and its enforcement domestically and internationally. I say I want to talk about the exchange of ideas. All exchange at its root is the exchange of ideas. Turning ideas into physical objects or into services rendered pushes us into the objective world of scarcity, if nothing else, of time. Taking something that exists outside of physical space and that is able to be shared at no marginal cost, and then turning it into a property that implies potential use of force for protection or the exclusion of use by anyone other than those holding that property requires an act of imagination. Of course, not everything imagined is lovely. You'll see here a picture of Lionel Robbins. So I'm going to step back and focus on the first term exchange. You see, there are competing ideas about what the study of economics is about. And one school of thought suggests that economics is the science which studies human behavior as a relationship between ends and scarce means which have alternative uses, which is a helpful description of the way that economists think about maximization and optimization. And that was the idea Lionel Robbins had. Nothing in this definition tells us what to maximize. That decision could be made by a dictator, by a committee, or by each individual, independent of what anyone else does. When Robinson Crusoe is on an island by himself, he has to make decisions about whether to go fishing or to gather coconuts. He is maximizing. He's economizing. But there really isn't a social problem there. The social problem begins when Friday shows up on the island as well. And it looks like this guy named Friday, apparently, is very, very good at fishing. Remember, we discussed earlier how Crusoe and Friday might coordinate their activities to their mutual benefit by each specializing in his comparative advantage. That is, each has an activity for which he has a lower opportunity cost than the other. And then they meet together to exchange, boost out their productive possibility constraint by doing so. Comparative advantage, that activity for which a person's opportunity cost is the lowest. But why exchange rather than just kill the other guy and steal his stuff? How does exchange begin? Most animals don't exchange. How did humans figure it out? Exchange reconciles individuals to one another. Instead of trying to persuade someone to do something you want them to do out of love or concern for you, it's easier to persuade them to do something you want them to do because it's good for them. This is the side of economics that is peculiarly human. Many economists have suggested it might have been better if instead of adopting the, the Greek term oikonomia, economy, which comes from the term for household management, that we had adopted instead the term catalactics, or exchange, which is reconciliation, to define our discipline. The first exchange is the exchange of an idea. This is because it is the least expensive exchange. As a matter of fact, it's free. Thomas Jefferson gave the example of a candle or a taper. Lighting a candle in a darkened room generates light not only for yourself, but for everyone else. If you take your candle and light it on mine, I have no less light. We both have more light. In any voluntary exchange, both parties are made better off in their own estimation. Those gains from trade are called by economists surpluses. Whenever one business earns greater profits, it must mean that other firms have lower profits, right? Is it not a zero-sum game? No. It's not a zero-sum game. It's possible that new ways of producing things are able to do more with less. That makes everyone better off in the long run. Usually, this requires some ingenuity and some savings. The manifestation of a new idea requires putting it into the new world, and that is costly. Having a new idea is serendipitous. You can't predict when you might have a good idea, just like you can't predict when lightning might strike. But we might want to give some people an incentive to stand on top of mountains with lightning rods in their hands to try to capture an idea. And then... Once that idea is in the world, the world is enriched. That enrichment that the development of the new idea creates 
goes only in part to the one who had the new idea, to the one who made it possible by saving and investing in it. The vast majority of the enrichment flows to the consumers and to the workers whose labor is more greatly augmented by that new idea. On the one side, the producer captures a wee bit of surplus from the many, many exchanges, and that must be shared with employees and owners of other inputs, while the buyers each capture a bit of surplus as well, and buyers often capture a greater share per exchange than the seller does. It's more likely that the grocer sells the apple for 85 cents than 95 cents because it has to compete with other grocers. And then the entrepreneur with the new idea will face more competition, pushing prices down until almost all of the surplus is captured by consumers. You are made better off year by year, not by an increase in wages that makes it possible for you to buy a larger share of a limited amount of goods, but by an increase in total productivity that means there are more and more goods to be purchased. The market process allocates benefits to individuals through making consumption less expensive, more so than it makes income greater through an increase in wages, though improvements in ideas make each of us earn more as well. But now we see the problem. If it's costly to develop a new idea, and the profit of an entrepreneur might earn from bringing that idea into the world is less than the cost of development, that new idea won't ever escape that person's mind. It will never see the light of day. It'll never generate light that can be shared. And other ideas that might have been kindled by this idea will never spark. We could wind up with an alternate history in which we are all still living in mud huts. Those of us who have the opportunity to live at all, all economic progress, all economic development, and all growth, every development that makes life today better than yesterday and tomorrow better than today is the result of some innovator bringing some new idea into the world by creativity and savings. No part of economic progress can be attributed to the worker who does not bring forward new ideas. No part of economic progress can be attributed to the landowner who rents out his property. No part of economic progress can be attributed to the owner of capital that is the same as the capital from yesterday. Only new ideas generate economic growth in the long run. Right? This is what Tabarrok and Cowan call cutting-edge growth. How shall we reward the person who brings her new idea into the world? Shall we tax away the profits she earns from her innovation? Shall we take her idea away from her and give it to everyone else? An idea is an example of a public good. Most of the time we talk about private goods. When there is a good that is difficult to keep others from sharing, we might try to put in place some sort of a barrier to turn that good into a semi-private good, like a club good. But some goods are public goods. If an idea is a public good, then once it is in the world, everyone can use it. But then that would reduce the incentive to share ideas. The justification for having patents becomes apparent. A patent provides the entrepreneur who has brought an idea into the world with protection from competition in implementing that idea for a given period of time. A patent does not guarantee profits. A patent does not work magic. If the idea is not desired by customers, that idea finds no market and its implementation earns nothing to repay the investment. A patent merely says to anyone else who sees your implementation of the idea, you can't sell that or make money off of that idea without permission from the patent holder, the owner of the idea. But there is still an exchange. In exchange for the protected privilege of exclusive implementation for revenue, of that idea for a limited period of time, the patent holder must share the entire idea. Every detail about a patent must be fully described. Any part of an idea that is not well described is not well protected. In this way, other developers can learn what has been done and seek out ways to build on top of the new idea. Thus, innovation proceeds. 
Every person in business has an incentive to innovate if it will capture them more business. Last year, for example, McDonald's started putting bacon on more of its products. This competition might put pressure on some of its competitors, but it benefits consumers. What has happened is that, since about the dawn of the 19th century, society has said to innovators, here, we will let you have a go at innovating something new, and if successful, we will let you keep the profits. We will even let you have some rents in the short run. But in the long run, we will let your competitors imitate your innovation, and you will get less profits. But all the rest of us will share the surpluses. This is what Deirdre McCloskey calls the bourgeois deal. And by it, she has estimated that the quality of life people in developed economies currently enjoy is 30 to 100 times greater than that enjoyed by almost everyone who lived before the year 1800. This development of ideas has also enabled the vast majority of humans to escape mere subsistence level living, with much of the gains coming in the last 20 to 30 years. This is marvelous. We should all be walking around with our jaws on the floor, utterly amazed at the incredible amount of flourishing enjoyed the world over. This is the closest humanity has ever come to getting a free lunch. Again, the deal is like this. In the short run, the innovator has a monopoly on her idea. If there are no patents, then as soon as a competitor figures out the innovator's idea, then there is competition, not monopoly, and prices fall, with surpluses accruing to the consumers. This could be recorded as a decline in GDP. Be careful reading GDP numbers. If a patent, however, is granted to the innovator, then the monopoly on implementation of the idea lasts longer, up to 20 years in the United States. That's a relatively short time frame in human history, but as the rate of innovation increases, 20 years has started to feel like a long time to some people. We also protect other kinds of ideas. We protect brand names that producers develop to communicate information about the reputation of their products, called trademark. And we have protection for creative works, called copyright. If an innovator chooses not to patent the idea, they just try to keep it a secret. In that case, if someone else copies the idea, the innovator is not allowed to complain. So we see here a picture of Coke that does that. Actually, any of you may be familiar with Agrigold, the local seed producer. They also function under a trade secret process. There's also the problem of plagiarism. So be careful not to plagiarize because there's software out there that'll catch you. So then the innovator always has a dilemma in front of them. What ideas are worth protecting? This problem is as old as the problem of property. A property in something is the right to exclude others from using it. One of my professors was riding with a congressman in a limousine one day in Washington, D.C., passing by the Washington Monument. The congressman said, Professor, look at that monument. Isn't it magnificent? and it belongs to you, the American public. The professor replied without missing a beat, Can I sell my part of it then? Property is alienable, and the bundle of rights that is a property is defined as the rights to exclude others from the use of that thing. An intellectual property, then, is a right to exclude others from using an idea, or to sell access to the use of that idea. But protecting a right can be costly, as the music industry discovered when the marginal cost of copying and sharing a music file fell to almost nothing in the late 1990s with the rise of Napster, and which you all can't really imagine now that you have Spotify. The best that you can understand about this is the idea of the mixtape, which most of you probably don't own. So what ideas do innovators patent? Easy to copy ideas. If an idea is difficult to copy, trade secrecy will often be sufficient to protect the idea. Mechanical processes are easy to copy. Drug formulas are easy to copy. Computer code is easy to copy. Once we have decided what ideas to protect as property, we have to decide how long we will allow them to be protected as property. Here we have a real problem. A one-size-fits-all solution is clunky and imperfect. Almost no general length of time will be appropriate for any particular idea. Ideally, the protection will be long enough for the innovator 
to recover the fixed costs involved in bringing that idea into the world. But not every idea is valuable. After blurred lines, Robin Thicke's Paula was a flop. Not every idea finds a market. Not every invention works. A monopoly on a good idea might not last long enough to cover for all the flops or bad ideas. Of course, even that has its limits. Most ideas are not good enough for other people to be interested. And many times, a person who is good at coming up with ideas is not good at bringing them out into the world. Different people have developed different comparative advantages. The owner of an idea has to decide whether to try to bring it out into the world herself or to authorize other people to bring the idea out for them and to share some of the rents captured for as long as the idea is protected. In patents, this means licensing the use of your idea, where other people pay you to use it. The payment for developing an idea will have to be greater than the cost of developing the idea and the cost of other ideas that failed, plus the innovator's next to best use of his time, or else our innovator will have to spend his time doing something else. And then there is also the cost of defending that patent and pursuing those who infringe upon that patent. So in this equation, you see the price patent holder will charge has to be greater than the cost not only of coming up with idea X, but also ideas Y and Z, and also the opportunity cost of doing something else other than coming up with ideas, and then also the cost of defending that idea. We tend to see patents only really paying off for big ideas, ideas that bring about very large shifts in the marketplace. Lots of ideas instead are simply brought into the world immediately without seeking protection, and the short-run competitive profits from any success quickly whittle away as rivals imitate successes. In some cases, the cost of defending an idea becomes so great that the entire industry shifts to less protection. Open source software is an example of this. Suppose we come up with an idea and decide to try to patent it. We then choose to license that patent to people who want to implement it into their products. What price should we charge for access to our technology? We go back to the problem of identifying a right price somewhere between the producer's willingness to sell and the consumer's willingness to pay. What's the right price? Any price in the range will consummate the exchange. There isn't a right price. There's a problem that might arise. My phone reads on thousands of patents. Some of those patents are owned by rival phone makers, and some are owned by firms that never made phones, or used to make phones but don't make them anymore. Who gets what share of the revenue from selling a phone? The phone makers all want to cooperate, so that if I have a Samsung and you have a Huawei, we can still talk to each other. Many of the patents, especially those that are for software that encodes and decodes voice signals, must be implemented in every phone. Every phone has to have access to all of the patents. This is called a network effect. This is the reason why the cell phone patent wars were so complicated. A network effect is the value of a product or service increases according to the number of others using it. If you were the only one who had a cell phone, what value would it be? Hardly any at all, but the fact that everybody else has a cell phone makes it worthwhile. I want to remind you of one thing here. The patent wars are wars over surpluses. You can see on this slide all the different firms suing one another in lawsuits. Here are the surpluses. We all want those surpluses to exist. For those surpluses to exist, that is an incentive for innovation. Because in the long run, we, the consumers, get the majority of the surplus. The patent wars are merely a squabble over surpluses. There is no right distribution of those surpluses. We are all benefited from living with other people due to opportunities to specialize according to our comparative advantages, to produce more of some good or service than what we individually need, and then to exchange some of that good or service for other things we want with other people. This process encourages peace, growth, and flourishing. This is the idea I can share with you. And my surplus is the joy of sharing it. A final word about the images in this set of slides. Most of them are copyrighted. 
How is it that I'm allowed to use them? The idea is that of fair use. If I make use of an idea, and it is obvious that I am not claiming to have originated the idea, then I am permitted to make fair use of it. For example, here's Porky the Pig saying, but it, but it, but it, but it, that's all, folks.